right, so for the next three months, we will be studying the book of Philippians. Everybody say Philippians. Philippians. Okay, it sounds Philippines, but it's Philippians. Oh, sounds Philip, <laughs> but it's Philippians. And why will we be studying the book of Philippians? Because one of the mega themes or the main themes of this book is about joy. Amen? Joy was mentioned in this book or rejoicing is mentioned in this book 12 times in this letter. And I think it is really appropriate, appropriate to start this year with joy. Everybody say joy. joy. Joy in the midst of difficulties. Joy in the midst of hardship. Joy in the midst of lack. So my prayer is that we will all learn the book of Philippians for the next three months. Amen? For until April. So we will study the whole book. I've got the outline for this when I when I attended a Bible uh, school, uh, sorry, a Bible class in ZMI, a Zion Ministry Institute, and it really touched my heart. Um, just a praise report last night after the whole uh, party of Elijah. You know how every most of us were here, uh, were there yesterday. Um, we tidied up for about two hours, three hours. Um, um, Alan was there, Eileen was there. She knows it. And then everybody was quiet at around 11.15. Then Kuya Phil texted me. She said, he said, um, Shalom, I cannot open your PowerPoint because I usually give my PowerPoint on a Saturday morning. And then 8.30 in the evening, he cannot do the, he cannot open the PowerPoint. And I said, oh Lord. <laughs> so I opened my laptop and the file was not working. Repair, it cannot work. Corrupt, it cannot work. Um, you know, it's, it's just Lord. And then I just had to do it all over again. <laughs> so I slept around 1 o'clock. I said, you know, this things happen. So for, for, forgive me if my PowerPoint is very um, simple. It doesn't matter. It's the word of God that will really touch your heart. Amen. And I really pray that this will speak to you. So forgive me if there's no Chinese outline as well there. But I could give you a copy. So that really happened. So I don't know what's happening with my computer. So please pray for it. But at least it's there. Amen. Alright, so as I've said, today we're going to study Philippians, and today we're going to study the background and the history of the letter of the Philippians. Amen? So let's just come to the Lord before we start, and let's just ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us, to direct us, to give us wisdom. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us this afternoon in this wonderful place, Lord, for a great um, service, Lord, to honor you, to worship you, to bless your holy name, O God. And as we dive deep into your word this afternoon, Lord, would you open our spiritual eyes, would you open our spiritual ears, our hearts, oh God, so that we may listen to what you're saying to us, oh God, in this series of the book of Philippians. Lord, it may be a three-month uh, lecture or a three-month um, uh, uh, word, oh God, but Father, every day, Lord, we pray that we will apply your, the, the words that we will be hearing today, oh God, and that we may listen to your voice, Lord. What are you saying to us, oh God? Lord, we thank you that we can start the year with joy. We can start the year, Lord, with rejoicing. We can start the year right before you, oh God. And Lord, we just offer everything to you. And even as I, I begin this book, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, you'll be glorified. You'll be lifted up, Lord. Lord, your name will be exalted in our lives, oh God. Lord, again, thank you. We bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. amen. All right. So the church of Philippians or the church at Philippi started when Apostle Paul was on his second ministry or second missionary journey in the book of Acts chapter 16 verse 6 to 10. So please open your Bibles in the book of Acts chapter 16 verses 6 to 10. It's in, found in book of Acts chapter 16 verse 6 to 10. So this book was uh, was founded in the second missionary journey of Apostle Paul. So let's read all together. It says there, Next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Verse 7, Then coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north for the province of Bithynia, but again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So instead, they went through, um, through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. Verse 9, that night Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. 
So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. So just a, a, a map for you to see. So Paul was in his second missionary journey, and his plan was to go to Asia, all right? So he was about to go to Asia, but the Holy Spirit said no. And then he planned to actually go farther to Bithynia, and the Holy Spirit said no again. How many times did the Holy Spirit said no? Twice, okay? So he planned to do something for the Lord. He planned to minister to Asia, to Bithynia, but the Holy Spirit said no for two times, all right? Twice. So you can see here that Paul was prevented by the Holy Spirit, you know, in Asia and to Bithynia. Bithynia is a province of uh, Roman. It's the northwest of Asia Minor. And two times, as I've said, the Holy Spirit prevented it. Because even if Paul's intentions were right, the Lord has a bigger plan. So they went to the seaport of Troas, which is over there. If you can see, that is Troas. So they went to the seaport of Troas. And in Troas, Paul received a vision of a man pleading for him. What did the man say? Come to Macedonia and help us. It's a vision, okay? It's a vision. It might be a dream, but it's a vision. The Bible says, and in Troas, Paul said, he saw a man saying, come, come to Macedonia and help us. So in Acts 16, 11 to 12, if you will read it further, they rode a boat, they boarded a boat, and they sailed in Samothrace, that's Samothrace, okay? They sailed in Samothrace, and they landed in Philippi. So where's Philippi? Over there. Now, during that time, Philippi is the leading city in Macedonia. Macedonia today is the southern eastern Europe, okay? So that is Macedonia today. Philippi today is the northern Greece, all right? In a bit of history, in 357 BC, Philip II of Macedon, or the father of Alexander the Great, conquered a town, enlarged it, and named it Philippi of Macedonia. And in 30, 31, oh, sorry, 31 BC, Philippi was conquered by the Romans, all right? So this time, it was conquered by the Romans. Now, when Paul was in Philippi, he looked for a synagogue in verse 13 to 15, but he found none, all right? When I talk about the synagogue, it's a place of prayer that requires at least 10 Jewish men. He looked for a place where people met for prayer, but he found none. So in Acts 13, 15, if you read it, Paul went to a river bank because he was looking for a place to pray. There was no place to pray. He went to a river bank. And when he went to a river bank, he found a group of women praying. And one of the women's name was Lydia, all right? Lydia was a businesswoman who worshipped God and she accepted what Paul was saying and her whole family was baptized, all right? So when Paul was in Philippi, he was looking for a place of prayer, he was looking for a synagogue, he found none, so he went to a river bank and he found women who were praying. Please raise your hand if you're a woman and please raise your hand if you're a woman of prayer. Come on. <laughs> I want women of prayer in this church, amen? Women of prayer is really powerful, okay? So he went there, and then Lydia and her whole household was baptized, all right? You know, what we learned here is that Paul has his own agenda. He organized his plan, but his plans did not turn out the way he wanted. No matter how we are prepared with our plans, God's plans were far better than what Paul had. You know, he prepared so much. He wanted to go to Asia, but God prevented him. His plans, God's plans is far better than that. And this is really applicable to our lives. You know, Paul had a vision. He only had a vision. But the vision was not in details. There was just a man shouting for help in Macedonia. But because of this vision, Paul moved to the right direction. I'll say it again. Vision will tell us, will not tell us everything, but it will let us move to the right direction. Amen? And we learn to obey one step at a time when God gives us a vision. 
You know, if God gives us a word, example, God gives you a word from the from in the Bible. Sometimes it's like, Lord, what does that mean? What does that mean in my life? You know, sometimes it's not so detailed. But because God gives you a word, you are moving to the right direction. Amen. That's the reason why you're here at church today. Because you are reading the word of God. Amen? And God is putting you in the right direction, placing you at the right place because you have received the Lord. Amen? And praise God, my dear friends, we are moving at the right direction. Amen? Who, who agrees with me? We are moving in the right direction. Our right direction is heavenwards. Amen? Our right direction is unto God. Amen? And here on earth, our plans may not be as, you know, we plan so much. Lord, we have made this. But, you know, sometimes it doesn't turn out the way we wanted. But take heart. God has a bigger plan for us. Amen? As we continue, if you open your Bibles in Acts 16, verse 16 to 19, the next uh, verses, you will see that Paul encountered a slave girl who was making fortune because of her fortune telling. And this slave girl followed Paul and the rest of them shouting, These men are servants of the Most High and they have come to tell you how to be saved. This went on for days and because Paul was exasperated and annoyed with the slave girl, he casted the demon out. You know, if you're fortune, if, if, if a person is fortune telling, my friends, that is not from the Lord. Okay, that is from the demon straight away. So all the, all the fortune telling on the palm of your hands, fortune telling on the cards, those are not from God. That's from the devil straight away. This slave girl was telling the people, this men are son of, of the servants of the Most High, and they, you know, they come to tell you to be saved. Days and days, um, they were, the slave girl was following Paul and Silas, and Paul was annoyed, so he cast out the demon in Jesus' name, get out of that slave girl. The demon came out of the slave girl. Now the slave girl cannot tell fortune anymore. And you know what happened? The masters of the slave girl got mad at Paul and Silas because the slave girl was making money. fortune. He was, she was making money for the masters. And that happened. So the masters of the slave girl got so mad, they dragged Paul and Silas to the authorities and even the crowd was in uproar. And a large crowd got so mad that Paul and Silas, they stripped and beaten them with wood and rods. And in Acts 16, 23 to 24, it says, Paul and Silas were severely beaten and then they were thrown in prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they did not escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Imagine that. Paul and Silas encountered a slave girl in Jesus' name, a fortune teller, and he said, in Jesus' name, get out of that woman, get out of that slave girl. The demon was out. The woman, the, the slave girl was set free. The people got mad. Imagine the concept and the thinking of the people. They love what the world offers than what Jesus offers. Amen? They were just, I cannot imagine and they got Paul and Silas, bitten them, throw in the inner dungeon, and they were locked in the inner dungeon. You know, um, imagine what happened to them. They were doing the will of God. They were preaching the word. They cast out the demon. They were doing the right thing, but the people did not like it, and they suffered. You know, friends, it is not always easy doing what God asks you to do. When you say you're a Christian, it's not a walk in the park. Many can laugh at you. Many can despise you. Many can even reject you for the sake of sharing the gospel. They can even say friendship over, you know, when they see you change from your old self to new self. But take heart, Apostle Paul and Silas was even badly treated and imprisoned for this. But take a look at what will happen on the next verses when they were in jail. Acts 16, 25 to 28, let's read. And around midnight, they remember Paul and Silas was in dungeon, okay? They were in prison. 
they were singing, praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Verse 26, suddenly there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundation. All the doors flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew a sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted, stop, don't kill yourself. We are all here. Wow, what an incredible, amazing thing that happened to Paul and Silas. They were in prison. What did they do? Did they complain? No. Did they got mad at God? No. In the difficult situation they encountered, they were doing the right thing. They were sharing the gospel. They casted out demons. People mocked at them. They suffered. And then they were thrown in prison. Did they get mad at God? No. no. Did they curse God? No. In difficult times, what did they do? They were praying and singing hymns to God in the most difficult situation. And what happened? The whole prison cells broke loose. Doors were open. Chains were gone. All the prisoners were set free. That is the power of praise and worship. That is the power of praying. That God can take our bondages out. Amen? And what happened? You know what happened with the jailer? He was about to kill himself, you know, because for sure the Roman government will not be happy about that. And in verse 29, the jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down, tramping before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sir, sirs, that's Paul and Silas, what do I need to do to be saved? Imagine that situation. When God makes miracle, people's eyes will turn to Jesus and they will ask you, what will I do to be saved? Amazing. When, life's, when your life is changed and people can see something's different with you, what can I do so that I can have that life that you have right now? You look so peaceful. You look so joyful in the midst of suffering. What must I do to be saved? Amen. And this is what happened to the jailer. He asked Paul and Silas, what will I do to be, be saved? This is the beautiful verse. And this is what I love. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who live in his household. Even at the hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced because, because they all believed in God. Amazing transformation. Amen. Amazing thing that happened to the jailer. He was saved. His household was saved. He cared for Paul and Silas, washed their wounds, and, they, and he was even baptized. I am so excited when somebody comes to us, you know, comes to me and say, Shalom, how can I know Jesus? And then that person will be changed and be baptized. Amen. That is God's work, not Amen. our work, but it was Amen. God's work. But it took Paul and Silas suffering first. And then they just stuck with the Lord. They praised the Lord. They did not give up. And God made a miracle. You know what happened to this verse? That is where the church of Philippi started. That is where the church at Philippi started. Because in Acts 16 verse 40, when Paul and Silas left the prison, they returned to the home of Lydia. Remember Lydia? There they met with the believers and encouraged them once more. Then they left the town. And that is where the church of Philippi started. Amen? Amen? There are three significant people in the foundation of the Church of Philippi. Lydia, the slave girl, and the jailer. 
I believe they started the Church of Philippi, you know, when Paul and Silas left that. And God used these three people and the circumstances that Paul and Silas encountered to start a church. And this is such an amazing testimony. The church, the Philippians church was composed mostly of Gentile believers. The church grew and became matured. And when Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians, which is the book of Philippians right now, the church was almost 11 years old, according to some historians. It has become a mature and established church. It's not a baby church anymore. So the church grew, the church became mature, the church uh, believed in the Lord, many were saved, you know, they were really doing good. And after 11 years, almost 11 years, Paul wrote a letter to them. And when Paul wrote a letter from the Philippians, he was at Rome under house arrest. I don't know how many times Paul was in arrest, in house arrest, jail arrest. Tell him, you know, every, you know, he was just doing, preaching the gospel, and he's not afraid to be arrested. My friends, are you afraid to be arrested when somebody, when the government says no more preaching of the gospel, no more saying about Jesus, you know? Are you prepared? You know, shalom, are you prepared? You know, somebody will see this video in the internet sharing about Jesus. Am I prepared to be arrested? Yes, I am. Praise God. Because, it, because there is such amazing, amazing reward from the Lord if you do this. Amen. So he was under arrest when he was writing the book of Philippians. And Paul was about 60 years old, you know. Um, when he was writing this, it's about um, AD 61, after death 61. And he sent this letter through Epaphro sorry, Epaphroditus, which we will learn in chapter 2. Epaphroditus delivered this letter to the Philippians when Paul was in prison, was in Rome. So I hope you understand the bit of a background of the Philippians, okay? Um, I hope it's clear. I hope you are, uh, when you read again the book of Philippians, when you start reading it, I hope you have a clear picture how the church started, what is the church, when was it written, how did Paul write it, where did Paul write it. So that was the book of Philippians. The purpose of this letter is, number one, to thank the people because they are financial givers. If you read the verses further, it's also an encouragement during persecution. And Paul also uh, uh, encouraged the people to press on knowing Christ, okay? That is the purpose of this letter. Number one, to thank them. Number two, to encourage them during persecution. And number three, Paul was encouraging them to press on. The theme of the book of Philippians is about joy, about rejoicing, about humility, about unity. This is a very beautiful letter. And the beautiful thing about this letter is this. There is no doctrinal error that Paul needed to correct, all right? The Philippian church were strong in their faith. They were obedient. They were generous givers. The only problem Paul mentioned is this, were two women who were not getting along. But other than that, the book of Philippians was full of praise and encouragement. If you read the epistles or the letters of Apostle Paul, you will see that sometimes he corrects the doctrines, you know, in the book of Romans, in the book of Corinthians, in the book of Galatians. He was correcting some doctrines, some errors of the people. But here he was more of giving praise to the people. So this is such a beautiful letter. And the whole theme of this book is really living the Christian life. I will end with this, and I hope that, uh, you know, I gave you a background of the Church of Philippians, where it started. And the lessons we learned from today is what Apostle Paul experienced. Number one, our goal in life is to share the gospel. That is the heart of Apostle Paul, to spread the good news. And I pray that this is your heart. I pray that this 2022, you will ask the Lord, Lord, I want to be active in the ministry. I want to, to evangelize more for you. No matter how much it costs, I will do it, Lord. Number two, I pray, you know, our plans, as I've said,
said may be organized, well detailed, perfectly outlined. But when God reorganizes our plans, when you God reorganizes whatever plans you have, we need to be ready to obey because God has a bigger and better plan for us. And lastly, obeying Christ is not easy, but it's always worth it. We may suffer for the sake of the gospel, but the suffering is only temporary compared to the reward that the Lord will give us. And that is where I will end the introduction to the book of Philippians. How the book, or sorry, how the letter of Philippians or the church at Philippi started. Did we get something this afternoon? Yes. <laughs> that is amazing. Amen. So for the next few weeks, we're going to study verse by verse until we end the book of Philippians. But I pray that these points will be in your heart today, you know, that your goal will be to share the gospel. Your heart will be always for the Lord, ready to obey. If he reorganizes your plans, let obey, just obey God, you know. And it's not easy, but it's always worth it. For Apostle Paul, his suffering created the church at Philippi. And because of the church at Philippi, we are standing here today, you know, as a church as well, knowing and pressing on because of what Paul wrote there. Press on to know Christ. Press on to know Him better. Press on to love Him. That is the book of Philippians. Amen. So I pray that you learned something this afternoon and keep it in your heart and be excited to learn more for the book of Philippians for the coming three months. Amen.